Denmark has decided to ditch coal. In 2012, the government introduced an accelerated phase-out of all its coal power plants. But rather than tear down the old power plants, designers decided to retrofit existing facilities away from coal power to plant power. From a distance, this looks like any other coal-fired power station. But Aveyur Power Plant, just 15 kilometres south of Copenhagen, is now producing a far cleaner source of power, bioenergy. Instead of coal, it's wood pellets and straw that are running the turbines. Instead of reinventing the wheel and building a new facility to burn this biomass, they've simply modified their existing plant. The transition from coal to biomass is not very uh, complicated because we can use the same equipment uh, already there. Uh, the coal have mills and uh, the wood pellets are milled the same way and blown into the combustion chamber with the air. In 2012, the Danish government introduced an accelerated phase-out of coal power plants to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. By 2016, Aveyur plant had switched its two units entirely to biomass, making it Denmark's largest and cleanest power station. When we look at the life cycle assessment of the green energy that we are using, the wood pellets and the straw, we are reducing the CO2 emissions by approximately 90% compared to when we are using coal. Key in Aveyur's successful greenhouse gas emissions reductions is the fact that the majority of their biomass is made from byproducts like sawdust and straw. Our biomass is mainly sourced from the Baltic countries where they have a big timber industry. Therefore, they also have residual products and they have waste products that we then have produced into wood pellets. The power station produces enough heat for around 215,000 Copenhagen households and enough electricity for around 600 households annually. Government incentives mean that even though coal is cheaper than biomass, the added cost isn't being passed down to the consumer. Coal is still a cheaper fuel than wood pellets, but when you're using coal for heat production, there is a CO2 tax on it. When you're using wood pellets for heat production, there is no CO2 tax. All in all, this means that we are able to produce green energy for the same price for the customer as when we were using coal. The plant's burning a staggering 7,000 tonnes of wood pellets per day and 600 tonnes of straw. So how do you minimise pollution? To minimise the emission from the plant, we have the same equipment as always with a coal-fired plant. We have an electrofilter to catch the fly ash. We have a desulfurization plant to take the SO2 out. As there is no SO2 in the wood pellets, it's now used to wash out the last remnants of the flue gas. So it's absolutely clear what's coming out of the stack at the moment. Aveyur is contributing greatly to the country's ambitious carbon reduction goals, potentially inspiring others to follow suit. The city of Copenhagen has an ambition of becoming CO2 neutral. We are a great contributor to this by making sure that the district heating that we supply to the city is made on green energy. Hailed as an energy game changer, UK company Ecotricity is providing renewable energy to the masses, mainly from wind and solar. But soon it wants to produce biogas on a mass scale using biomass, grass to be exact. Grass. The United Kingdom is covered in the stuff and these rolling fields have inspired some of the country's most prominent romantics, from John Constable to William Wordsworth. Well, now the UK's landscape is inspiring a whole new generation of thoughts from entrepreneurs such as Dale Vince. A few years ago, we discovered that we could make gas from organic sources and pump it into the gas grid, just the same as we do with green electricity. So we set out then, a few years ago, to find uh, a good way to make green gas. Uh, we've we've come up with the idea of making it from grass and so it's become a major focus of ours that we now have the answer for electricity and gas where we can get them from in the future sustainably. Ecotricity is already producing 700 gigawatt hours of electricity from the sun, wind and sea. But now Dale has set his sights on upscaling biomass using green gas mills. Well, a green gas mill is a place uh, where we can take organic material, break it down in the absence of oxygen and uh, produce gas that we can scrub up and put into the gas main uh, on, on a par with fossil fuel gas. Uh, grass is appealing because 
It's got a greater energy density than food waste, twice as much. It produces cleaner gas, but it doesn't come with the problems of energy crops, uh, which are all associated with intensive farming, pesticides and fertilizers, and loss of habitats for wildlife. So how many homes in the UK could potentially be powered by green gas from grass? And how much land would be needed? The UK has a surprising amount of grassland, something like 12 million hectares. And if we harnessed half of that, 6 million hectares, we could make enough gas to power almost 100% of British homes by about 2030. This is the design of the company's first green gas mill, built in collaboration with Sparsholt College in Hampshire. The biomethane domes are going to be constructed just behind me uh, and they will be operating in a process not unlike brewing where grass and other crop materials are brought in to generate the biomethane gas from farms that are in, within the local area. As well as hopefully providing gas back to the grid, the college's green gas mill has another advantage, feeding back into the next generation. One of the many benefits of having this located at the college is for the future workforce. That's, that's not only agricultural students who will be harvesting and, and uh, processing the crops of the future, but those who will actually be operating the biomethane gas plant who will have to have all sorts of other skills that they'll need to learn here at this college as well. Grass is not only a sustainable source of energy, it also has a very low carbon footprint. When natural gas is burned, so-called natural gas, is a fossil fuel, the carbon that's been locked up for millions of years is released into the atmosphere. When we burn green gas, we release carbon that was recently absorbed from the atmosphere by the grass when it was growing, so it's carbon neutral. Uh, so it's a way to have gas and not put new carbon into the atmosphere. Apart from producing green energy, domestically, for environmental reasons, Dale believes it's vital for energy security and independence. We can make all of the gas we need here in Britain, making us independent from uh, global fossil fuel markets and prices and the insecurities around the world that are inherent in that. Uh, we can create massive nature reserves on an unprecedented scale by turning the land organic, something like 100,000 jobs, an 8 billion boost to our economy, and have climate neutral gas and take real steps towards fighting climate change. When we talk about bioenergy, we cannot really say that it's carbon neutral, can we? We have to look at the life cycle assessment of bioenergy. Now you have some examples where you have wood pellets being flown from America to Europe to be burned in European power stations. Is this really better for the environment? Well, actually, biomass co-firing can lead to important greenhouse gas emission savings without the need for significant investment in infrastructure. And this makes it uh, a valuable option, at least in the short to medium term, mm -hmm. uh, to reduce the carbon intensity of power generation. Uh, ideally, from an environmental and economic sustainability perspective, mm -hmm. what you would need is an abundant, uh, stable and sustainable supply of affordable biomass at the local level. Mm -hmm. However, if that's not available, uh, it's also possible to use high-density uh, pre-treated biomass such as wood pellets uh, that can be easily transported, including overseas. Mm -hmm. So overall, uh, biomass-based electricity uh, can lead to significant greenhouse gas emission savings compared with fossil fuel-based electricity, at least 50% uh, mm -hmm. saving. What is the difference between first and second generation liquid biofuels? Well, most biofuels, uh, liquid biofuels currently available on the market are produced through first generation technologies. Uh, so first generation ethanol uh, is obtained through a process of fermentation of sugar and starch crops such as sugar cane and maize, while first generation uh, biodiesel is produced through a process called transesterification starting from vegetable oils such as rapeseed, uh, palm oil and soybean. Uh, second generation technologies uh, enable the production of liquid biofuels uh, from agricultural residues such as straw or from permanent grasses such as wheat, wheat straw and uh, miscanthus through a process um, that in entails the use of enzymes. Andrea, thank you so much for having us today at the FAO. Thank you, thank you for coming. There's a long way to go, but scientists are looking at new and exciting ways of making biomass as efficiently as possible. And as the world's population expands, food and fuel compete for land, so solutions are needed fast. 
We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Sustainable Energy. Join us next time and we'll be looking at how gas can play a part in your sustainable future. And in the meantime, if you have any questions you want to put to our expert, you can tweet them to us at CNBC Energy and use the hashtags AskSE and hashtag Sustainable Energy. Thank you for tuning in today. It's goodbye from us. In the meantime, keep thinking green. Goodbye. Still watching? Perfect. Click here to watch another great video from CNBC International. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.